Um, I, I have, have you started recording? Yeah. Good. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to repeat myself again as to why we are doing this particular session today. Is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the clinical testing, but at the same time, I'm going to explain to you exactly why we are putting certain tiny touches to the maneuver so that we know exactly what we're doing to prevent ourselves from going out there in the clinic just aping what tutors tell you to do and at the end of the day you're unable to re clinically reason why you're doing a certain test. So it's fairly important to understand why you're doing small maneuvers for each clinical test. Today what we're going to do is the knee joint. So we're going to do some of the common, um, some of the common clinical tests for the testing for the knee. Okay? Starting with the most common one, which is your collateral ligaments. Or if you look at new textbooks, they tend to call it the tibial collateral and the fibular collateral ligament. So, can I have a volunteer? Excellent. Have, yeah, have you got shorts? Yeah. Oh, excellent. All right, so ready. Good. Now, if you just lie back for me. To warm my hands. Because it's very cold out there. Oh god, why am I stopping? <laughs> right. So if you can't see just uh, make yourselves just 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 crowd around, okay? And and the person with the video camera just walk around. Make sure that you're okay. Pass me a pillow. Right, so the first test that we are going to test for is the medial collateral ligament or the tibial collateral ligament. Now, the video that I've shown you in your notes shows you the testing in two different positions in full knee extension and in roughly about between 20 to 30 degrees of knee flexion. Would you know the difference if you were to test it in full extension and in slight knee flexion? What would be the difference? The quads would be more stretched in this position. Yes, it would be. Um, the quads would be more stretched there. Let's think about the joint mechanics. When we're talking about the knee joint, um, at what point is the knee most congruent to each other in, in terms of the femur and the tibia articulating each other? Extension. Extension. So if we were to test, let's say for example, the knee in full extension like that, would it be, would the opposition of the joint be its most compact? And also in this position, it's where the ligaments are also at its tightest. Okay. Do you remember I told you that when you stand up with your knee fully extended, the muscle supporting it is um, uh, there's less muscular activity because all the capsular, all the ligamentous structures are its tightest and therefore can actually hold it m much more on its own and there is less muscular activity. But there, are, but there is a problem, is that when you're putting the knee in fully extended position, then there are more structures that are tight, so which means that if you perform the uh, any stress test to stretch out any particular ligament, you're not just stretching one ligament. So there is less what less uh, specificity in terms of a particular structure. But it is possible to do that because if you just want a general overview of roughly where the structure is being, so it, whether it's medial or lateral, then it's fine. You can do that as well. And then what you can do is then put the knee into a slight flexion to have slightly more specificity. Okay, then you reduce the number of structures because once you put that certain structures there, relax, and then you can test some of the other, the other structures more. Good. So the, the way we do the medial collateral ligament, what we call in some circles the vulgus stress test. Okay, so the reason why it's called vulgus stress test is because the knee has been placed in a vulgus position, which is um, the knee joint moving towards the midline of the body. Whereas the opposite way you test for the lateral collateral ligament is when the knee moves away from the midline. So that V-shape, so imagine this is the midline of the body and the 
vulgus moves towards the midline, the varus moves away from the midline. So for the medial collateral ligament, we will do the vulgus stress test. Firstly, you need to stabilize the thigh and the femur. Next, you need to hold on to the either the ankle or the rough, roughly around the tibia. And the reason for that is because we are going to have two forces. We're going to do this. Okay, when you do that, the joint then goes into a vul vulgus position. There is a particular, um, there is an extra movement that you need to do, is you need to do a slight external rotation of the knee, of the tibia. Do you remember why? What happens if you externally rotate? Everything becomes tighter in a joint. Do you remember the, um, what's that phrase I've got? I keep forgetting that phrase. Screw home mechanism. That's correct, screw home mechanism. Thank you very much. Screw home mechanism. Doesn't look very good on the video, but it's okay. <laughs> that I can't remember what I what I what I, what I, what I, what I wrote. <laughs> Screw home mechanism. So do you remember the screw home mechanism when you extend the knee, the femur immediately rotates to screw home and locks the knee. But the opposite equivalent of that would be your external rotation of the tibia. Okay? Because if you think about it, if you hold on and stabilize the femur, instead of the femur immediately rotating, it will be the tibia externally rotating. So we need to do that. So what it does is then it creates a slightly more tension on the medial collateral ligament. So that's why you do that, hold on to there, create a force, but you also slightly externally rotate because then you'll find that it's actually easier to do. And then what you do is you simply Okay, stabilize yourself, always stabilize yourself so you've got leverage and then push in, so I'm going to exaggerate the movement so that you can see push in like that and push out like that on the, okay so let's do it again, so you see that? okay right, if you can't see what's going on I've actually done a vulgus and hers is a very nice because she's got a vulgus movement do the all crowd round so that you can actually see this movement Now depending on how big or small your body is, you might, the leverage might change. If you are a very strong person, you can just do that. But I'm not a very strong person, so what I've done is I put it, my hand very close to the lateral uh, femoral condyle and then I increase my lever arm for the tibia so I can rotate that and look at her. You see? You see that? See that tibia? Going and I'm actually I can feel a stretch from her medial collateral ligament. <laughs> right, so we do exactly the same thing for the um, lateral collateral ligament, except that if I were to continue doing this, I can, which I can, but it's slightly more awkward. You can see that I can do it. You see, I've actually done the virus stress test, except that it's a bit awkward for me. Okay, but if you want to do it slightly differently, all you can do is to actually move it slightly to this edge and simply sit and use yourself as the um, extension of the plinth so that you are, I'm doing exactly the same movements as what I did just now, okay, but right now I'm doing it stressing the lateral collateral ligament. And I just realized that this blend is too tall. Let me just lower that for you. Good. Okay. Great. Now, so again, slight flexion, external rotation, femur, block, and. Okay, let me just bend slightly. There you go. You see, when I did it for slightly more extended, there was no movement whatsoever, you couldn't see the virus at all. Now if I were to flex it slightly by doing that, make sure that stabilize everything, you can see that there is actually more movement on the tibia. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So what you do is you do a gentle stretch and you simply push it outwards and you can feel the stretch of the lateral collateral ligament. Got it? Good. You okay there? Mm. Cool. So that's the Lateral and medial collateral ligament stress test.
or bogus and viral stress test. The next um, test that we want to do would be the uh, anterior drawer test. And the, and the anterior drawer test, as most of you would know, would test for the um, anterior cruciate ligament. Okay? How we would do that is quite simple. <coughs> Imagine if it's her left knee that I want to test for. So what I do is I place the left knee in 90 degrees flexion and the hip in 45 degrees. So it's simply just in a crook line position. And then what I do is I need to stabilize and make sure that the foot and ankle doesn't go anywhere. The reason is because after this we're going to do a force that is pulling the lower limb in towards me. If I don't stabilize it, this is what will happen. It will just simply pull her leg and it will extend, which means that you won't be, the, the test won't be accurate. And also if I'm, if I'm very strong, which I'm not, that will pull off the bed as well, which you don't want to do. So which is why you can just sit here. You don't have to squash your toes. You just need to form a block. Okay, so just, and then what you need to do next is, do you remember we palpated for the knee joint line? So is that, that uh, articulation between the femur and the tibia around here. What you do is, you palpate for the tibial tuberosity, put your both thumbs just next to the tibial tuberosity and just slightly and feel for the joint line. You need to do that because you need to be able to feel the displacement of the tibial plateau moving forwards because that's the indication of whether someone's ACL is either lax or torn. Next, you want to be able to, because if you're just putting it there, you're unable to hold on to the tibia which you want because what we're, the ultimate movement we want to do is move the entire tibia anteriorly that way. So which means that you have to have your fingers curved around just above where the um, tendons of the gastrox are. Okay, so do that. You can see that it's a very nice comfortable position for me. Everything sort of fits very nicely there. Okay, so, and then just curve around. So by just, just make sure you don't pinch her skin because it, it can be quite painful. And with that, I can actually, I'm already grabbing hold of the entire tibial plateau. Next, we want to proceed is to actually simply translate it forward in a jerk movement like this. Okay, so she's got a slight translation. Okay, let me just double check if it's normal translation or uh, abnormal translation. You've got quite a lot of translation actually. <laughs> Have you injured your ACL no. before? No. So it's fine. If she says she's not injured her ACL, I means she should not injure her ACL. <laughs> Trust the patient. <laughs> but she has got, uh, if, if, if you've got trans to feel her tr anterior translation, it's actually more than what you usually feel. Okay? So, but um, according to books and as well as the videos that I've shown you, roughly if someone translates between about 5 to 8 millimeters, about that, which is actually quite a lot, okay? That means that potentially it's torn. Now, in what, uh, why are we doing this anterior translation for, and testing for ACL? The ACL prevents the tibia moving forward. That's right. So if you actually think about the ACL, okay, this is, if you remember how you remember the position of your ACL and PCL, and this is her left. So if you think about it, essentially the ACL is doing that. And what I'm doing is I'm pulling its lower attachment forward and therefore stretching out like that. Okay? Do you think it's easier to test this on someone who has just injured the ACL one day ago as compared to someone who's injured the ACL two months ago? Which one is easier to test for and see that they've torn the ACL? Two months. Two months. And the reason for that is? Swimming. It's actually. If someone just injured it one, one day ago, if you do that to them, they will <coughs> smack you in the face. Okay, they won't let you do it. And besides, there's so much swelling probably that you won't feel the translation anyway. Okay, even if, there were, if, even if the person's very stoic and can bear the pain, 
you won't see the translation anyway. So which means that that particular test would be you would get a either a muddied um, sort of presentation or it will be just simply very um, you you won't get anything out of it and anything useful. Okay. So that is the um, that's the anterior drawer test. Do you understand? Anything you want me to explain for this anterior drawer test? Fairly straightforward, isn't it? Okay, now since we are here, uh, to prevent myself from repositioning, repositioning, repositioning her again, we can actually do the posterior draw test, which is to test for the PCL. And it is exactly the same positioning and handhold, but this time around, instead of pulling it towards me, I push it in downwards like this. Got that? Okay, so again, you can see that why I'm doing this is, yeah, I need to twist up my fingers. You can see that this is the position, my index finger here is the position of the PCL, like that, and therefore by doing that, I'm actually stretching it out. So if it was um, torn, then it would have a give. Okay? So that's the reason why we do that. And why don't we do the ACL, uh, the anterior draw test in full extension on the knee? Because it's locked and therefore we need to put it in 90 degrees to actually allow movement of the knee joint. Got that? There is a similar anterior, there is something, I, actually another test that is very similar to the anterior draw test called the Lachman's test. Okay, the Lachman's is actually um, similar in terms of its movement where the tibia is being translated forwards to test for the uh, integrity of the ACL but the knee is placed in slightly more extended position at about roughly 30 degrees like that okay so in order to do that you could okay let me do it that the other side so it's much easier so in 30 degrees it is still a it is still not fully locked. So then what we need to do is we need to reposition our handholds in such a way that we stabilize the we stabilize the femur so that we can actually translate the knee forwards. Okay. So what we do is I need to do this a bit lower. Okay. It depends on how you like to do it. Okay. So what I do is I put it in slight, and then what I do is I hold the back of the tibia, stabilize the femur, and I go, okay, or, I don't like this test. The reason for that is because my hands are small, okay, which means that I do a lot of work, okay. Ideally, I should be able to just simply hold on, stabilize the tibia, and just go move forward. But because my hands are small, therefore, I have to position myself in a way that I need a lot of leverage. Okay, which is I always do always do the anterior draw. It's much easier for me. I don't have to do very much. Got that? Good. So that's the Lachman's test. A accompanying um, sort of um, an accompanying test to the posterior draw test, which is the test for the PCL. It's called the posterior sag. Okay, the posterior sag. Okay, underneath that one so that you can have a rest. The posterior sag is such that you just simply place the person's knee in 90 and hip in 45 and what you do is just leave it there and just look. Uh, that's even a better test for a lazy person like me because all you have to do is just look. What are we looking for? We're looking for um, the, um, a dip of the tibia that goes down Usually, in a normal knee without any um, cruciate ligament torn, especially because this one is a PCL, the tibial tuberosity, if you think about this plane, it will be the most anterior point. Okay, if you think about this slope here, the tibial tuberosity should be the most anterior point. But if the PCL has been torn, it won't be able to hold the tibia in place and therefore that tibial tuberosity will appear to dip down and you get a dip between your, the apex of your patella down to the tibial tuberosity. Okay? Obviously, we can't show that unless I tear her PCL, but 
it is some some it is sometimes very odd. Look, uh, let me just put this up a bit so that I can see and you can see as well. Hold on to the femur like that. Lift the foot up from the plinth and then get them to straighten the knee. Can you slowly straighten the knee? Okay, slowly and straighten. Okay, if they've got a tight hamstring, you just lower it down slightly so that they don't, you know, it's not a hamstring stretch that you're trying to achieve. Okay, and down. Okay, now, as you can see, I'm going to put my finger on her tibial tuberosity so that you can actually see what's going on. As she moves and straightens the knee, I'm going to follow it. Okay, go. Okay, straighten, 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 straighten. Good. So this is the normal movement of the tibial tuberosity. If the person has got a has got a uh, posterior um, sac, positive posterior sac test. So what will happen is that this tibial tuberosity will be located here. And then when she starts to straighten her knee, straighten her knee, it will actually, at some point around here, it will actually go back to the normal position and it will correct itself. But as she goes down again, and then the sac will start to appear and come back down. Right there. Got that? Good. So that's the posterior sac test. So let me see. Done all of that. The next one is the at least test. The last one is the at least test. Okay. The at least test is a catch all test for to test if you are if it's a generically ligamentous problem or a meniscal problem. So for this, we will get the person to go in a prone position. Go in a prone position. There we go. Okay. Are you okay there? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Now for this, you will need to lower the plinth much lower. <coughs> the reason is because you need to put your um, leg, uh, your, your lower limb to stabilize the femur like that. Okay. If you can come a bit closer to me, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So, get the person in knee flexion. And the reason for that is because you are trying to, again, unlock the knee in this position. <coughs> the movements uh, for the at least test consist of a distraction of the knee joint that way, as well as a compression of the knee joint that way. Okay. Now, if we think about all the structures surrounding the knee joint, we've got the ligaments on this side, that side, and then you've got the um, patella tendon on that side. And then we've got a meniscus in between the knee joint. If you were doing a distraction force that way, opening up the joint, what particular structures will be stretched out? Yep, all the ligaments will be stretched out. In fact, it's not just the collateral ligaments, but the surrounding anterior and posterior passive structures will be stretched out as well. Okay. If you were to do a compressive force downwards that way, what structure will be compressed? The meniscus. The meniscus. So you can see why we're doing that. Now, that is the basic movement of the at least test, but that's not everything because we will be contributing a rotational component to it as well. So we will actually be, as we pull up, we will also do a rotational component like that of the tibia. And the reason for that is because with that, you can selectively then stretch out either the medial or the lateral ligamentous structures. And with the compression, you will also then be able to compress the medial and collateral. Even if you, even if you don't know which one, which particular, whether it's medial or lateral, by doing a sort of catch-all rotational component during compression and during the um, uh, distraction, you will then be able to catch some of it. Because if you just simply do a one plane, no rotation, you might not actually um, stretch um, all of the structures that you are supposed to test for. You got that? Now this is a catch-all, which means that it can't tell you exactly which particular structure. You have to then go ahead and then palpate and do the necessary um, uh, more specific tests.
to find out which structure is being injured. Again, this is only useful if the person has got no swelling, okay, because then obviously if there's swelling, it will muddy the, um, your, the accuracy of the diagnostics of it. So let's do it. And so, firstly put one leg over, make sure that you don't lean your full body weight on it because it's actually painful, okay? And then what you want to do is do a natural, I mean you could do, you can hold it below the medial and lateral malleolus, but I would not advise you because then you'd just be doing the stretching of both the knee joint and the ankle joint. So what you want to do is put it above the medial and lateral malleolus, malleoli, plural. Okay, so when I say above, I'm talking about the anatomical position. So obviously this is now below, but anatomically it's actually above the malleoli. And with that, you are, or you could also use your fingers to curve round and trap the malleolus. Because with that, then you are able to then do control the rotational component, sorry. It's my fault. I'm, my hands are very bony, it's actually very painful to grab onto patients. Okay, so you can actually do things like that. You can see that I, I start to curve round. So I'm both putting my grip above and below the malleoli. So you can see that then controlling the rotational component is so much easier. Okay? And part of the web between my the 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 web between my index finger and um, thumb is used to control the foot to further enhance the rotational component. Okay, so to do a distraction, what you do is you hold on tight and you pull up and then you turn medially, laterally. Okay, don't be afraid. Okay, and always look, don't just look at the leg, look at the patient as well to make sure that they're not grimacing because they're grimacing means that it could mean two things for me, but to you, most likely, is whether there's pain in the knee joint or For me, most likely, it's because my grip is terrible as well. Okay, so I have to ask, is it because of my grip? Yes. <laughs> See? I knew it. Okay, so that's for the distraction bit, where you s distract, you do medial and lateral rotation to see where is the pain coming from. And then, you can do a Distraction, uh, sorry, compression, where you push your upper body weight down. Okay, you can see that for very strong people, they just simply use their upper limb and just simply push down, and then they can do a rotational component with assisted by the other hand doing that to stabilize the tibia. But for me, I probably need to give a bit more compression. So what I do is I do this. I put my half, half my body weight on it, and then I do a rotational component by twisting myself around. Got that? Okay, so it really depends on how large you are. For a small person like me, I just use whatever I can and reposition myself. And always be careful that the force needs to be down the shaft, straight down and onto the joint, and not in a slight angle because if that's the case then you'll be stressing the knee the ankle joint too much as well in terms of that so if I were to do this this is the wrong way to do it you can see that I'm not actually really exerting very much compression there are some but actually I'm not doing very much on it so you need to go right on top and do that push down and then do a rotational component got that good Thanks, man. thank you is there anything else that I forgot to cover on the list? Yes, that's right, McMurray's. Thank you very much. Okay, so McMurray's is to test for the uh, meniscus. So, can I just, before I start, can I just declare that that's the worst test that um, I, in, in, in terms of my handhold, I'm not very good at it. I've, 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 I've tried it for years uh, and, I, and I'm still never, not very good at it, okay? So, but let's do it anyway, because I need to teach you. <laughs> okay. Now, the reason for that is because of the, of the way you need to do the hand holes and do the rotational component of the tibia. And, and some people do it beautifully. So, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just teach you the, um, 
components of how to actually do it. Now, the McMurray's test is to um, stress the um, stress the meniscus. Okay. So what we want to do is to um, cause a rotational component of the tibia uh, in a way that stresses a particular um, that stresses a particular part of the meniscus. And I find it fairly counterintuitive, but it's actually correct. Where if you if you immediately rotate uh, the um, you, you immediately rotate the tibia and you extend while you push in and, and compress the joint, you're testing the lateral meniscus. If you laterally rotate the tibia, okay, and you compress and you extend, you're testing the medial meniscus. You got that? There is a slight vulgus and varus component to it as well to help to accentuate it. What I meant was, you remember when we're doing the vulgus and varus test? So to accentuate when we're testing the lateral, you can actually do a bit of vulgus because if you think about the femur, tibia, when you are actually doing um, medial, lateral, uh, medial rotation, you do a bit of vulgus and then you extend it out, you can see that the contours compresses on the lateral meniscus, okay? And do the opposite applies as well. So let's do that. Okay, so in order to be able to control the medial and lateral component of this, you need to hold on to the ankle and by using your forearm and your hand, the palm of your hand, so that you can actually hold on and be able to control it. So you can see that without even touching the femur, with that handhold, I can actually control flexion and extension. But once it goes in full extension, obviously, I can't push it back because it's locked. Okay. So with that, I can fully control. Let's do the uh, uh, lateral meniscus first. So to do the lateral meniscus, what I need to do is to immediately rotate the tibia. See that? Okay. And what I do is I push my hand very gently on the femur and stabilize it. And then what I do is I do a, I compress upwards that way, and I go that way whilst I extend the knee. So let's try again. So hold on, need really rotate the tibia, push upwards, and you'll feel that you are on the edge of the joint. So it's almost like scraping the lateral tibial condyle with the femoral tibial condyle. Okay, so you do different ranges to check which is the bit that is giving you the problem. Because each, each particular extension bit, each bit of extension would actually test different parts of the meniscus. Okay, so, and then what you do is, let's test for the medial meniscus now. So you need to laterally rotate the tibia, hold on and push, give it a virus sort of force, and then you push it and compress the medial tibial condyle with the femoral, uh, medial femoral condyle and do extension. What I've done is I've done the inner range, mid range, and outer range. Okay? And as I was doing that, did you see that I was trembling? <coughs> because I'm using a lot of force. And that's why I said that I hate this test. But this is just a personal choice. I absolutely hate this test. Okay. Any test that I missed? Does everyone understand what to do? Obviously, the mo most complex one is the McMurray's, which is probably I, why I subconsciously forgotten about it. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you very much. Is there some time for um, now? If you just stop the recording, that'd be great. <laughs>